gotten some of his emails, and now I, he gets asked some very difficult questions. <laughs> I am not an astrophysicist. Um, yeah, the reason I was, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I just saw these slides this morning, <laughs> so it is going to be a little bit of a stumble, but I was involved. I'm not part of the SARB, um, but I, um, I wear a couple hats at Goddard. I was involved with the initial CFE development, the core flight executive, but I am currently the um, flight software product lead for the global precipitation measurement mission, which is using the CFS and help develop part of the, some, some of the CFS apps. And I was actually interviewed as part of the SARB's report as a customer of the CFE and CFS. So the software architecture board, it was established in 2009 and there was a software complexity study that was done and I do, you know, they had gone around the various NASA centers and one of the recommendations of that um, was to create the software architecture review board. And the NASA Engineering Safety Commission is the one that are, is funding this. So um, I know they did, at least when they came to Goddard, they did this, uh, I think it was two days, and they, they really poured through a lot of stuff. And it was a very thorough um, review, and those are the review team members down there. And it was included people from all across NASA and APL. So it was, um, they, were, they were a really good team. And they do have a website, which, um, although I don't think the report's out there, I'm not sure, but um, you can certainly see what the Software Architecture Review Board is doing. And Dan Dvorak is from JPL, I think, is the head of it. Um, so the CFE, and actually I have a talk tomorrow on this, the current state of the CFE, CFS, and unfortunately, <laughs> For this part, the CFE is the lower level, the core flight exec, and CFS, and we've gotten ourselves tangled up in names, it's a core flight system, and that, things have evolved, and sometimes we use core flight system to mean everything, but basically those are the applications that sit on top of the CFE. So um, we developed this, you know, as we realized we were doing this clone and own, and it wasn't, you know, being as cost effective as we thought it could be, and we also realized there were certain requirements that were always common across missions. So that's kind of what drove the CFE to be developed. And, um, but it was targeted, as it says here, for Class B um, for spacecraft and instruments, although it's had very limited instrument use. Um, and again, the applications are the CNDH, GNC, thermal and power. And there's actually a lot more. At the time they did this, it's really, the last year it's really taken off. But um, Ames, Laddie is using it, and Johnson has it down with their Morpheus and APL RBSP. But there's, I have a list in my talk tomorrow that goes through a bunch of users, but this was essentially, and actually they didn't mention GPM or uh, MMS, but. <laughs> so here's a typical, this one kind of jumps right into it because it's actually a layered architecture. But um, when you get up to the application layer, this is a typical lollipop diagram as we call it. And uh, so the CFE itself, the core flight exec has five applications, and they're basically ground interface applications to get to the services. And um, I don't want it to, this chart's a little misleading. And once, I mean, it's true, the, the blue ones are the CNDH apps, but not all of them are CFS apps, meaning they're not in our library of CFS applications. But we do have 11 that are in the um, library currently. Um, and I'll, I have some slides tomorrow that'll show that. But basically, it uses a software bus as its inner application communication mechanism. And as far as the SARB, that's, that's probably about enough for this presentation. So the, the objective was to identify architectural issues and then recommend, and actually they came up with a great, they've written a really good report that's um, got a lot of great recommendations. So and again, they focused on the architecture, so they weren't worried about detailed design, I mean, they detailed design, but not uh, they weren't doing code reviews or anything. And it was, um, like I said, they did interviews, tabletop, they had just poured through everything. So they did write a report this year, and, uh, and I guess I'm not sure where it stands in terms of being released by management. Um, findings was that it was well thought out and, um, and I guess knowing a lot of the background, I mean, yeah, we used a lot of people that had a lot of years of spacecraft experience and we took the core elements and said we always have these features. 
I mean, and there's some, you know, there's some issues because some of the things, trying to generalize things just because they're used doesn't make it easy to generalize them and parameterize everything. So, um, and as you heard, even with the IRADs, I mean, you start pushing new limits that aren't outside the initial domain. It, it, some things take re-architecting. Um, they, but as far as they went, they did four categories and governance, um, use on projects, architecture, and documentation. And I couldn't agree more with, <laughs> we're fighting this battle right now. Governance is a huge issue right now because um, it really is, it's, it's spread around all over the centers, but we as Goddard don't have institutional funding to manage something outside of projects. So we're really, we're working hard trying to get some additional funding and we'd like to take it to the NASA headquarters level because it really has been distributed across all the agencies. Um, it's just getting the right people with the right purse strings. So it really, it does have a lot of potential right now and I feel like we're at a good juncture to make things happen. But that's certainly a second bullet, certainly true. We lack a business model that um, is sustainable right now. So we're, we're at a kind of a critical juncture. Use on projects, um, I could say they, they interviewed multiple um, centers. It, uh, it is mature, I mean the CFE, the, and the CFS apps are now mature, and like you'll see tomorrow, they're all in their second version. You get through your 1.0, but they're all two point something, and they've gone through their initial process of being generalized. And that certainly is true, it's promoting collaboration. We work closely with Laddie and Ames, and we're working closely with Johnson, and we've had IRAD, shared IRADs with APL, so it's, it's really been a great um, collaborator. Uh, it says code violates some standards. I think where this one came out of was they ran it, I, I don't, we've actually, and probably since this was done, I think this was more where they ran it through some static code analysis, and I'm not 100% sure on this bullet, but we have been working with um, IV and V, and they've run all the CFS and CFE through multiple static code analyzers, so, and we've made several changes because of their inputs to us. Um, and that's another area we wanna grow. If it, as it becomes more of a collaborative community, we definitely want IV and V, you know, utilize their um, skills and tools. And, and applications, and def, this is, um, in, we, we definitely, we did a heritage analysis for everything, but it wasn't, if people are familiar with product line type work and domain analysis, we did some, but we didn't really track all the variabilities and where you're gonna push your domain. And that's, you know, it takes a lot of resources to do that kind of analysis. So it's certainly, we gotta keep an eye on, you know, what domain it was originally written for and how far we can stretch it. Um, and I, yeah, I definitely, the open source, and it's nice if we could get this out to students and then if somebody gets familiar with it, they just jump in. Um, as far as architecture goes, um, yes, I, we have a, we had development guidelines and we had architectural guidelines as well, so when we were, tried hard to make sure they were enforced during all the development. Um, we do use a publish, subscribe, software bus. So um, this has been very, very helpful, especially in the development environment um, because things are, you know, you don't have to map out static tables. And it does help encapsulate the applications and that's one of our whole goals is to have an application library and you might even have different, we just did this with an application called Limit Checker where another project wanted a variant of it. So we literally have two Limit Checkers now living in the library and that's okay. So you can get different performance, different reasons why they want the different one. Um, but although a drawback is, we did give up some um, determinism, and, uh, but there's always gonna be those trade-offs. Um, some more architectural findings. Uh, we do have, it is a layered, I have a diagram tomorrow. It's a very, you know, I've got well-defined layers, there's two critical ones that are in from the platform layer up and then the one between the CFE and the applications. And CFE shields apps from data structures, I'm, I'm almost, to a degree. It was, an, it was a goal, but I mean, I'm not sure that's 100%, but um, I think it does a decent job. And the OSAL has been a very, that's been open source for a while. This is the operating system abstraction layer. 
and uh, that's been out there, and that's, that's been useful, and we've even had somebody recently on an instrument where they didn't take the CFE, but they still took the OSAL and wrote their own mini layer, but at least they did switch between Artems and VxWorks, and it, it served them well when they, because they had coded to the OSAL. Um, it can be you standalone, I guess. Um, the one at a just overflowing handle, this is, um, I guess, a negative here is that it drops newer messages and subscriber is not notified. Um, the ground still gets a notification, but the application itself doesn't know when a message has been dropped. So again, that's, that's kind of down in the details, but these are the things we can certainly look into. And another, the, the seconds and subseconds are derived from different sources. And, and I'll, I'll add to this, just on GPM, we use GPS. And having time has been a challenge in general. And you know, it's part of the CFE, it's a service, and we definitely push some, when it was initially designed, you can only abstract with the foresight so far. So, and that's one of the areas I think each mission, we end up having our own little side partner time manager that assists the CFE, so the time distribution, or the time management is uh, partially CFE and partially our custom GPM time. Documentation, well, this one, <laughs> we knew this one was a problem. And, and as again, it was done, we had limited resources, and I think there's three pages here of documentation issues. <laughs> so it's not unusual with the software, but uh, it's, um, the architecture description document, yeah, that's, that is definitely incomplete. We've tried to add some resources to get it um, better. So one, the one good thing we do have, though, is for each application we have going, the design documents are configured with each application. So we do have those, but we don't have a comprehensive, good CFE architecture description document. I'm not sure where it stands right now. What, um, we did use, you know, it's not like we used UML. We used just generic, not even called generic, just ad hoc. <laughs> so it's, what is documented isn't, I mean, there's data flows, but there's not, it's not a standard notation. And uh, representation and terminology, we can't even, we gotta get nailed down CFE versus CFS and <laughs> we'd be good there. Um, that's the next one is a big one where, and this comes back to the governance. If we get a good collaborative community, I mean, we really wanna have, um, and that's something I would like to do here is have a splinter or maybe over dinner tomorrow night is get some feedback from anybody that is using the CFE and what they've done to it. We're trying to collect, I have a slide tomorrow that has some of the things that have been done, but there's been a lot of neat work going on, and we don't have the infrastructure right now to collect this in a useful way. And we've certainly, Laddie, we, you know, we did emails. So we get emails and then we put in bug, you know, bug fixes and stuff. But again, that doesn't communicate it to everybody else in a nice way. Um, and then as you say, it's, it, the document doesn't say what's optional and I guess I'd add to that is the other thing we really like, we don't have is a deployment. I, I can easily see a deployment tool because there are a lot of configuration parameters and um, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna, it's only gonna get more complex as it gets more abstracted. Um, so the distinction, I've already mentioned that. Let's see, the, yeah, we do not have a, a good view of the publishers and the subscribers. I mean, you can dump the routing tables once it's instantiated, but um, it's, not a, it's not in a nice, concise way. That one drawback, we used to have static, the software bus history, historically it was a static, you'd build all the links and then compile it in. But the, and so then you'd always have that easily visible. Um, description of dependencies, yeah, that's, that's lacking. The rationale, we have some of that, but not, not enough, definitely not enough. Um, and especially at the architectural level where you're looking at your illities, you know, flexibility versus um, extendability or whatever. You're, it, it, we didn't capture those during all the discussions we had. We had plenty of meetings, but um, the testing guidelines, that's another area that is, um, the CFE, we, we develop, we have unit test and build test, and the build tests are actually used the configuration parameters in the flight software so they can be rebuilt and actually rerun using the ground, but they're for a specific ground system. Um, called Assist, that's at Goddard, and so we 
we do deliver with that, but that's, only, that's not for the CFS. Well, that's not true. I guess the apps have it as well. So that's across the board, but we do need, and an area I think we need as well is if people make local patches and want to rerun unit tests, it's not clear, you know, that's not well documented or, but it is doable. Um, and again, it was initially for Goddard type missions. The quality of service is not well documented and Actually, this just reminded me because Susie Strage is in the back. <laughs> She's actually the product lead for um, the core flight system now. So um, she is a great resource. And, and I was about to make a statement and so she can keep me honest because uh, I'm not sure the quality of service is fully implemented yet. <laughs> it, so it's not documented, nor is it fully implemented. So. <laughs> um, and let's see. we and, Right, we, we don't, there is that lacking that guidance, the second bullet there. Um, the fault management for philosophy, and I guess we don't, I mean, I, um, yeah, we have this application called Limit Checker, and it works in com combination with our stored command, and they work closely together. So, but it's not, again, we don't have, I, we're lacking that system oriented documentation that says how to play. We, we have the knowledge inside of Goddard how we've done this typically, but we don't. It's not there from a user point of view to say, oh, use it this way. And, and uh, startup procedures, let's see, uh, sorry, I'm kind of, must have ran out of time before I reread all these. But uh, expanded time services, I think in general we're going to learn as we go across multiple platforms too. So we'll get better there. Again, that's where I think community feedback would be really useful and we get everybody's experience. Um, the performance data, and this is an area, yeah, we, we actually have built in, we, we have our own custom tool and it's not available yet um, through our innovation program office that can, we have built into the CFE, you can put little markers and it'll trace execution in a, in a RAM, Arian RAM, and then you can dump that and then we have a ground tool that'll analyze it and give you a nice looking, looks like a logic analyzer output. Um, but that tool was not yet part of the package and it's one thing we, It'd be nice to do. Um, and there's actually a handful of other tools that have yet to be. We have table tools, we have stored command generation tools, and they're just not all there. It's not a complete package yet. Um, I'm not 100% sure what this last bullet's getting at, so I have to punt on that one. <laughs> okay, in conclusion, um, so it, it got favorable. Reviews and uh, we've and it, it has you know we've had success from the people that have I, I've actually been surprised with some people that have been able to do with some of the documentation limitations but they Johnson in particular has really run with it and they've done some great stuff down there um, which they really want to get back to the community um, there it was it, it has a lot of heritage so um, a lot of it came and the people were still around so we could leverage some of that which is really important. Definitely needs improved documentation, and we've got to get this governance problem solved. Um, as they, they proceed with caution, um, and that was one of the reasons this one particular instrument had a very high performance requirements, and they, they were hesitant. And that's one thing we don't have. We don't have good measurement data on different platforms that's available to everybody to look at. And that would be another community type thing I think would be great. So that's why this one particular instrument just went with the OSAL and stopped there. Epilogue, let's see. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely thought they had a lot of relevant things and we're using, we're trying to use that as leverage for getting um, some more institutional funding. Um, and as and she does mention here, okay, the Class A effort and that's Johnson's actually interested in human rating the CFE. Um, and we've been, you know, Glenn has it, Kennedy has it, and Kiri is actually the Korean Earth Space Research Institute, and they're very interested in collaborating and working with us. And let's see, and we've, some of the IRADs were um, mentioned, so there is some IRAD work still going on, but again, we haven't folded things back into the main channel. The governance model needs help, and we have Jonathan or Susie, I'll have Susie's contact information in our charts tomorrow. 
And Jonathan Wilmot's also in our branch, and he's been doing a lot of the collaboration with Johnson and other agencies. So you can certainly, you can certainly co contact Jonathan. But um, I think that's, that is it. Okay. I will try to field questions. I can field them from my perspective, but not <laughs> Lorraine's, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the question was with ITAR and what, yes, yes, that is an issue. <laughs> and I'll get a little, not necessarily about ITAR, one, one of the issues, something I'd like to see is we, we couldn't make our command ingest and telemetry output applications because we can't put those in the CFS library. We're restricted because that's our interface. But we do have something called CI lab, command ingest lab and TO lab that are just UDP based, real simple apps that help you get going in the lab environment. And I'd love that to be even part of the open source. So that way, you, with a goal being out of the box solution, right now, you know, CFE by itself doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do much. <laughs> it does stuff, but it's, it's not a, it's, it's just an open framework. So yeah, no, that has been an issue. And I'm not even sure, I mean, something I just recently learned, I didn't realize when CFE went open source, it was just that one version. We're not allowed at this point to put out the next version. So I'm, there's still hurdles we got to understand and overcome. Any other? Yes. So, from the architectural review board, was there uh, issues with trying to understand what are the architectural elements that we're studying versus design constructs from how they differentiate the architecture attributes that they were going to look at in the review versus the design or implementation? That's a hard one for me to answer. I'm not sure there, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Um, the question was, yeah, did they look at it? How, uh, I'm sorry. How did they decide as a charter what to look at? Right. The architecture versus, you know, messing with the design. Right, and so how did they, as a charter, you know, what to look at from an architecture attribute point of view rather than from a detailed design point of view? And I, I don't know, and I don't know if it's on their website of how, what they were, they're driving or the methodology was for doing that. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But they came out, I thought, with some really good recommendations. I like their product. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thanks. <laughs> That's it. All right, so with that, it's, it's lunch. Uh, for those on the WebEx,